uh, tell us Spark fans. Uh, my name is Toby. We are in for a real treat today uh, because we are talking uh, to a, a real live um, paleontologist from the University of Calgary. And uh, we're going to be talking all about dinosaurs today. So uh, get your questions ready. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to our guest. His name is Jared. Uh, hello, Jared. Hi, Toby. How are you doing? I'm very well. How are you? I am doing great. Excellent. So um, you have uh, one of, I think, the most uh, fans' favorite jobs, uh, passions, hobbies, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, I think every kid, I know I was, um, when they were growing up, what do you want to be? I want to look for dinosaurs. I want to look at fossils. Uh, and you've done it. You're doing it. So um, how did you get into paleontology? And um, yeah, what are, what are your passions? Yeah, so I mean... I've always kind of told, joked about how it seems that every paleontologist has kind of the same origin story, if you will, or it's just like, we all wanted to, we all saw Jurassic Park, or we all just loved dinosaurs as a kid, and we just wanted to get into them. We love natural worlds, so we just played around with snakes, lizards, all sorts of little creepy crawlies, but um, yeah, so during school, we just stuck with the science and just started learning more and more. And then once I started to get into uh, college years, I decided that's where I wanted to go. And so just started pursuing a career in paleontology. And it just kind of since then, it just kind of worked out. That is fantastic. So you've taken that uh, kind of childhood dream and, and gone with it. That is brilliant. So um, tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, so I am a student, currently a PhD student at the University of Calgary, and um, my research is focusing on dinosaurs, but specifically within a group called Tyrannosaurs. So this includes the, the famous T-Rex, the a bunch of other ones. Yeah, there's, so there's a whole bunch of different species of Tyrannosaurs, and my research focuses on, on those animals. And so learning about what they were in life is basically how I, how I, what I study. That is fantastic. Um, so uh, to the viewers out there, if be it on um, Facebook or um, YouTube or wherever you're watching us from, uh, you can send us your comments and questions uh, for Jared to answer. So any of your uh, favorite dinosaurs, um, any facts that you want kind of checked, um, or if you just got a fact for us, uh, tell us about your favorite dinosaur too. So um, Jared, uh, what is your, like, we'll start the big thing. What is your favorite um, dinosaur here? Yeah, so my favorite dinosaur is actually a really close relative of T-Rex, but it come, it's a completely different species. It's this animal that's called Chondrosaurus, and it's, it looks like a T-Rex, but it looks like if you had taken a T-Rex's head and just kind of pulled it out like taffy and made it really long and slender. And so this is the picture here of something called Chondrosaurus, and it's really different from all other relatives of T-Rex, all, really, all of the other really close relatives of T-Rex, and having that really long snout. And so if you look at other relatives of Tyrannosaurus, you'll see that the skull is much what we call deeper it has it's much um it has a much deeper snout and so it had much more of a bone crushing kind of bite than this this really bizarre long snouted type of dinosaur there you go yeah this one it looks like it's missing its teeth but i'm i'm guessing it would have these razor sharp teeth here just like um the the other tyrannosaurus we saw Indeed. Yeah, it did have a bunch of teeth and it would have been, uh, it still would have been a predator, but it probably wouldn't have hunted the really big like duckbill dinosaurs or horned dinosaurs like some of its bigger cousins would have done. All oh, right. So that kind of leads us to our next question. Uh, we've got actually a, a few questions from the audience here. Um, one from F. Kennedy's. Uh, they say that uh, their favorite dinosaur is the Stegosaurus. Um, uh, what else have we got here? Atticus, hello again. Uh, welcome. Uh, what is the smallest but very deadly dinosaur from Atticus here? A small but very deadly dinosaur. Well, there are there are lots of dinosaurs. And yeah, so raptors are kind of one of the quintessential kind of um, what are kind of thought of as like the deadly dinosaurs. But there's actually a whole bunch of different raptors more than just Velociraptor. And Velociraptor in and of itself was actually fairly small, but also uh, would have very been a very very deadly hunter probably towards uh, smaller animals as well as maybe even some medium-sized uh, things like protoceratops. So mm -hmm. raptors seem to have been very deadly, but then if you even get smaller, you can even get into modern birds and stuff like that where you, they, they're deadly to insects and sometimes even smaller mammals. Yeah, right. So it's, uh, it's all to scale. Exactly. It depends on how big they are. Yeah. Um, great. So uh, we'll go back to your work for a second. Uh, mm -hmm. and focus, you focus on uh, the Tyrannosaurus. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm guessing this is probably uh, maybe not what it looked like. <laughs> it's close. It has the basic, yeah. the basic overlay, big head, tiny arms, big body sort of deal and lots of teeth. 
Um, but my research is kind of, it's, it's kind of all over the place. I do a bunch of different stuff specifically with Tyrannosaurus. So what I focus on is looking at their evolution. So looking at the different species of Tyrannosaurus and how they, how they are different from one another. So how does T-Rex differ from that really long snouted Chongosaurus again? Mm -hmm. But also I look at another aspect of Tyrannosaur biology or Tyrannosaurus, which is called their, uh, which is looking at how they grow. And I think I, I sent you a picture there which is looking at the, um, the way that they go from these really small, uh, really slender bodied animals to these much larger, bigger um, animals. It looks like, hang on, I just got to That's it fine. <laughs> um, it looks like I may, I'll have to come back to that one. <laughs> okay, that's fine. But yeah, so that's, that's one aspect. I'm looking at like how these animals grew up. So they go from their smaller, their smaller body, their smaller body juveniles or babies to their much bigger adults. But I'm also looking at um, another aspect that I'm looking at is looking at their brains. So we take in the same way that we can go to, you can go to a hospital and get a CAT scan of your head to see if you're, if anything's wrong with your, with your brain. Um, we can also do the same thing with, with dinosaur skulls. We can actually take them to a CAT scanner and put them on and we can actually shoot a bunch of x-rays into that skull and actually get the, the, the data that we get back or the information that we get back. We can actually see the, we can start to reconstruct what the, the brain and what the other soft body structures on the inside of the skull actually look like. And so this is a uh, kind of a picture of one of those uh, brain of a Tyrannosaur called Gorgosaurus. And you can see the actual brain part here in blue and uh, kind of the inner ear structure. So the inside of the ear is that in pink. And then the yellow is the, the all the nerves that come off of the brain, all the nerves and blood vessels. That is absolutely fantastic. So you're actually looking at a dinosaur's, well, what a dinosaur's brain would have looked like-ish. And uh, you can see the different size and the, mm -hmm. the uh, different parts of it. That is amazing. It's kind of traveling mm -hmm. back in time there. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Jared, what, what is your favorite, uh, or what is your best discovery to date? What have you found? So, we recently, so I'll talk, well, I guess we'll talk about the, the Tyrannosaurus sort of aspect in, the, in a minute, okay. moment or two. But um, personally, the, the biggest find that I've had so far in terms of like what I have found when I've been looking in the field for fossils uh, was of a, uh, it was a skull of a pachycephalosaur or the, the dome headed dinosaur. So those are the ones that you can see often, or you often hear of oftentimes uh, where they were butting heads together, kind of like you see in modern bighorn sheep and deer. And so here you can see the skull of that, that animal there uh, with my thumb pointing to the, the, what would have been the closer to the, the snout of the animal. So that, that big rounded mass there is the top of the head of this animal. And wow. currently to date, that's my, that is my favorite thing that I have found so far. Yeah, it is. That is amazing. How did you feel when you found that? I was re I was really excited. I uh, we were out looking for um, just any any kind of sites that we could find, and um, we hadn't really found any, found much other than a few bone fragments with some turtle pieces that here and there, turtle shell pieces. And then uh, I walked around the corner uh, next to a river, and I looked on the ground, and down I had fallen out of the cliff. There's this perfectly rounded skull cap right there of a pachycephalosaur, and I was like, fantastic! Look wow. here. Yeah, that is amazing. That is awesome. So um, we've got a few uh, questions and then we'll get okay. back to uh, the Tyrannosaurus and what you found on that one. Um, so we've got one from uh, Robin. Um, their son, Thomas, wants to know if you've ever found an ornithomimus. Sorry for my There that's we fine. go. Yeah. Um, I have found little toe bones of ornithomimus oh, so there's, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of ornithomimus just like there's a whole bunch of different kinds of tyrannosaurus but i've found little toe, toe bones um but other than that they're they're kind of a rare animal um i have helped dig up some bits of ornithomimus but again just like kind of the smaller bits of toe bones and stuff like that um but yeah they're kind of a rare animal uh but they're really interesting because recently my actually my advisor and some other researchers that she was working with actually found out that these ornithomimids or these ornithomimus like animals actually had feathers. And they were the, actually the first instance of feathers being found in a, on a dinosaur from North America or fossil feathers being preserved, I guess. That, that is amazing because I heard that even uh, this guy here mm -hmm. uh, may have had feathers. Is that true? It's possible. It's the current evidence thinks that 
we or we don't have any evidence directly of t-rex and it's really close relatives the really big tyrannosaurs having feathers yet yeah. um but we know that their ancestors did so they're really close they're mm. when you start going back further like millions and millions of years before t-rex actually showed up tyrannosaurs were a lot smaller they weren't they weren't these big apex predators that were uh roaming and, con- and conquering the land yet they were much smaller they actually lived in the shadows of, of things like allosaurus um, and when they were that small, they had feathers, but something happened between when, then and when they got really big that led them to lose feathers. And we haven't quite figured it out yet, but that's still a, still a mystery to try and look into. So the research is still uh, evolving as well as, exactly. as, well as the animals. Um, I've got a question that kind of follows on from that from uh, Florence. And uh, Florence wants to know uh, what colors were dinosaurs? Do we know that? Is there any evidence to say, uh, were they green, were they purple or, or pink? So actually, this has actually been a really recent development. So figuring out dinosaur colors for a very long time, actually when I was growing up, was considered to be impossible. We thought that there was no way that we could ever figure out what color dinosaurs were. Um, And recently, though, there have been some new front kind of new science has been pioneering uh, learning about this, looking at these little tiny structures that are called melanosomes. And we have them in our hair and we have them in our skin. And what they do is they basically give their pigment, they give color to um, the structures that they're in. Usually for what we're looking for is we're looking for them in keratin. So the same structures that make up our hair and our fingernails, uh, we're looking for little tracers of these color molecules. And some dinosaurs, when we find feathers of some dinosaurs, we can actually go, we can take a microscope and look really deep into the, into those feathers. And we can actually see what colors they were. And so there's usually the animals that have feathers, we can see them. And so we found so far, we found animals that are black, or um, we found animals that are black or rusty red colors. Um, The famous ankylosaur from the museum, uh, the Royal Trail Museum, that's always, that's been all over the news in the past couple of years. uh, That one was kind of a rusty red color. Wow. So we've been, it's been kind of a very interesting discovery. And there's still new frontiers to try and do that to see if like, okay, were there some of the really bright colors in these animals as well, like the blues and yellows and greens and stuff like that, that we see in modern birds. And that's still a question that has yet to be answered. But hopefully, if we get some really well preserved feathers, we can actually start to see some of the some of those colors as well. That's amazing. It seems like uh, paleontology is a, a, a study that's got tons and tons of room uh, for research and uh, for more discoveries. So Absolutely. Not found yet. Lots of blanks. Yep. Um, so uh, we're going to hop back. We're kind of going back okay. and forth here. Um, we're going to hop back to uh, your research in uh, Tyrannosaurus. Uh, do you do you study uh, a specific species or um, is it the whole kind of a group of Tyrannosauri, Tyrannosauruses? <laughs> yeah, so, so it's kind of the whole group. So one of the main things that I'm looking at is like exactly what, again, what makes all the different species different. Uh, I got my start on an animal that's much more common in Alberta or on Tyrannosaurus that's more common in Alberta called Gorgosaurus. Mm. Um, but since then, it's kind, of, it's kind of been modified a little bit here and there. And one of the things that we've actually discovered in recent years um, was we actually, there, it was kind of, it was a fossil that was sitting in the cabinet at the Royal Trail Museum. And it was uh, of a completely new Tyrannosaur species. And that was something that was, I was really excited to kind of find. And so myself and a bunch of my colleagues started to work on identifying this thing and describing what makes it different from all other Tyrannosaurs. And so at the end of the project, we discovered that this was a new species of Tyrannosaur and that we called it, we ended up calling it uh, Thanatotheristes. And that translates to the Reaper of Death. Reaper of Death. So I'm guessing it wasn't a, a vegetarian dinosaur. Nope, we don't think it was. It had some fairly large teeth, and it was uh, it was a decently large animal. And we're still looking for more of these of this species because it's a very interesting. It tells a very interesting story. But um, yeah, so I think I sent you some pictures of it. If, uh, if you wanted to show those off, something like that, really quick. Okay. But yeah, so it's it's a very interesting. It has close relatives here in Alberta, but it is mm-hmm. uh, it has some really peculiar characteristics. Yeah. So. From this picture here, the you can see those white lines on its upper jaw. Those are um, these ridges. These, it had these very prominent ridges on the bones of its upper jaw. And while they might not have been able to be seen in the actual in the actual skin of the animal, they may have been. We're not really quite sure. Um, it was very interesting to see those those kind of ridges because it, it shows it tells us a very interesting story about how this particular species evolved. And so. Yeah, so there's some really interesting stories that I think that will come out about this animal in the future, and we're we're still looking for more of these species in the the area that we're in the area that we first found it. Oh, that is amazing. Um, so kind of coming off of that, um, 
the most prominent feature I'd say about this dinosaur here, I'm just staring at its teeth. Um, we had a question, um, so I'm just gonna try and find it again. Uh, it was about bite force. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any way that you can calculate how hard their bite was? Sorry, I can't find who that was from, but um, yeah, bite force. There are actually, there are uh, a bunch of different ways that we've actually been able to kind of um, test by force and there's different methods that we use and those different methods will get you a little bit different results. Um, but one of the people that I work with, Dr. Francois Terrian of the Royal Trail Museum, he has actually done a lot of work in terms of determining bite force in different dinosaur species. And um, there's one of the ways that he did it was kind of looking at, you take like a whole bunch of segments or like cross sections of the lower jaws, and then you can apply a model to those to try and determine how much force those would have applied. And then there's other ways that we look at how much muscle attachment they would have had. And with that, we think that Tyrannosaurus had bite forces around 5,000 Newtons. So um, trying to think of exactly, it, it would have been really powerful, stronger than a crocodile's bite, if that's wow. the same thing. Oh, that is brilliant. Um, Chantel here wants to know uh, what dinosaur had the biggest teeth? Biggest teeth. Yeah. Um, Tyrannosaurus rex might actually be up there in terms of like having some of the largest teeth, at least relative to its, to its, uh, at least in terms of like the, the, the large predators. But there are some other ones that had uh, some fairly large teeth as well. And then there are actually some dinosaurs that had no teeth whatsoever. They lost really? them entirely. Yeah. So going back to those ornithomimids, they actually completely lost their teeth. But I think Tyrannosaurus might have been one of the larger toothed. Um, species. I'm trying to think if there were any that would have made it had like larger proportional teeth. Yeah, but T. Rex might have been some of the had might have had some of the largest teeth. Wow, awesome! Um, I've got a question here that was sent in to us. Um, this is from Layla, and uh, she wants to know about different types of dinosaurs. So let's see what Layla has to say. How many dinosaurs are there? So I think that was uh, how many dinosaurs are there or were there well Pretty that's a tricky question there big <laughs> question well it's actually it's a really good question too because um contrary to what a lot of time well not necessarily contrarily but uh kind of what people don't really realize oftentimes is that birds are actually dinosaurs and there are at least 10,000 species of birds in modern times uh but and new estimates suggest that there might be even eight up to 18,000 different species of modern birds but in terms of like the non the non-bird dinosaurs or what we call the non-avian dinosaurs currently there's about a thousand species of uh, diff or a thousand different species of dinosaurs that we currently recognize. And with how much time we have going back uh, and how much time, time dinosaurs live for, it's very likely that there were thousands more than just a thousand. There are probably tons and tons of different yeah. species that we have yet to discover. Wow, that's fantastic. And um, are there places that are, are better for discovering dinosaurs or uh, fossils, the remains, um, around the world? Are there kind of hot spots where you can, you know that if you're going to go to this place, you're going to find some dinosaur bones? There are indeed. And actually, Alberta is considered to be one of the best hot spots in terms of all the dinosaur fossils that you can find here. The Dinosaur Provincial Park is uh, widely regarded as one of the, as one of the single-handedly the best sites for finding dinosaur fossils in the world. Um, another good site is Mongolia uh, and then Montana, places like that. And then there are other places all around the globe where um, we have little smaller sites that are really important for determining dinosaurs that are not from or not the same kind of dinosaurs that we have here in Alberta. And so there's sites all over the world that are that we're looking for. And then there are sites, sites that are still not yet discovered. So there's still plenty of discoveries out there to be made in terms of new species of dinosaurs and new specimens and just all sorts of just amazing discoveries out there just waiting to be made by the next generation of paleontologists. There you go, viewers. So lots of stuff to find. This is uh, still kind of, we scratched the surface, I guess, um, figuratively and literally uh, of the ground to find those fossils. So uh, lots more to be found. Um, I've got a question here um, doo -doo -doo, from... Uh, Bored child, probably not their real name. Uh, what's the oddest fossil you've ever found? The oddest fossil I've ever found. Um, there was one of the things that I remember finding was a little tiny turtle shell. Um, it was like a little piece of a turtle shell. And I can't remember the, what it's exactly called right now, but I remember what's weird about it is that it had these little tiny bumps. But those these bumps were really weird in that they had these really, right, they were almost like little spheres that had just, been glued to the top of the shell and so they were like perfect spheres like you could see underneath them and around them but they had just been they just sat on top of the shell and it's just really kind of bizarre to just 
to to have just seen those little tiny bubble looking things on top of a little piece of turtle shell and i don't know what the turtle actually looks like in li- what, it, what it would look like in life but it, it's a very interesting story and it's something that i've always kind of wanted to know more about of this this particular species of turtle the, the bubble back turtle the nice bubble back turtle exactly <laughs> Um, I've got one from Holden, who is seven here, uh, and they want to know which dinosaur had the smallest arms. Smallest arms. Well, so there are, it's actually not T-Rex. T-Rex actually had, compared to some of the other dinosaurs, there are, um, there are these little tiny dinosaurs called Shuvasaurid, or Shuvasaurids, that had one-fingered arms or albarezosaurus, sorry, shuvasaurus is a type of albarezosaur. And they had these tiny little one-fingered arms where they just had one claw. And then we have one species here, one species of those albarezosaurs here in Alberta that's called mononychus. And that literally translates to uh, one claw. Um, but other than that, there are also some really, and these were smaller dinosaurs. So these were not these really big meat eaters. They might've been insectivorous. So they might've been eating bugs and such. Um, but there are also some other famous dinosaurs, something like Carnotaurus, which is this, it means meat-eating bull. Ooh. And it was, it had these really prominent horns on its head, but its horn, its arms were very small and actually were laid almost completely flat against the back of its body and pointed backwards. And uh, right. compared to T-Rex, the, the, those arms were much, much, ta- much, much smaller. Right. Wow. A uh, meat-eating bull. I wouldn't like to come across one of those. <laughs> Um, I've got one from Liam from uh, Liam from Cochrane here, uh, and they would like to know what the top speed of uh, the T Rex was. Uh, could they run, or did they just walk? So there's a lot of different kind of ideas about how fast Tyrannosaurus could go, um, and it's kind of up to the model that you look at, so the, the the scientific model that you look at, and what kind of methods do you apply to learning that. Um, but kind of the, the consensus is or what most people kind of think nowadays is that T-Rex was really heavy. And so as they were larger or when they were adults, they were probably actually not very fast. They probably were actually not able to fully run. And so when, it, when you're running, running is actually when you have, there's a point in your stride or when you're, when you're moving that both feet are off, off the ground at the same time. Mm. And so it's kind of thought that T-Rex, an adult T-Rex didn't actually have a point where both of its feet were off the ground because if a t-rex were to trip and fall it would have been would really be bad. bad yeah it would have broken bones broken ribs and so it would have probably not been really good for it to uh to have been running and it might actually have killed it to a run or killed it to a fall but as juveniles they're actually comparatively their legs were actually very long so when they were younger their legs were a lot longer compared to the rest of their body and so it's actually kind of thought that as juveniles they were extremely fast and very dangerous predators uh, for smaller animals. And then once they started to get bigger, they started to put on more mass and they started to get a little bit slower. And so they started hunting bigger animals. So there's the idea that they actually changed what they were eating to from faster animals and they were while they were faster and younger. And then once they got bigger, they started to become slower and a hunted little bigger, lazy, slower. A bit heavier, kind of like humans, maybe. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, talking about humans, uh, Bennett here um, is interested to know if you've ever found an ancient human. I have never found actually an ancient human uh, fossil. It's uh, there are protections on that in terms of like archaeology and stuff like that. But uh, where I grew up in North Carolina, um, we were actually really famous for having artifacts of uh, First Nations or uh, First Nations peoples. And so one thing that we would actually do with my uncle that I used to do is I would go out with him in some of the farm fields and stuff like that. And you could actually find tiny spearheads and arrowheads. Uh, from First Nations people there on the ground. And it was really interesting to, to find those sorts of things. And he was a, he loved doing that. And he had like a whole, he had like whole pictures of stuff that he had found as a, uh, throughout his entire life. Oh, that is fantastic. Um, so we've, we've got tons and tons of questions here. Thank you very much, viewers, for sending these in. Um, lots to do with uh, your, your favorite, the Tyrannosaurus. Um, Benson here wants to know uh, about their eyesight. Did they have good eyesight to what we know? They actually, so I think in Jurassic Park has kind of given them a little bit of a misconception or, or kind of made it a little bit thought that Tyrannosaurus didn't have very good eyesight. And if you stood still, you would be able, you would be fine. Yeah. Um, based on what we actually know about Tyrannosaurus, especially Tyrannosaurus Rex, Tyrannosaurus Rex had very forward facing eyes, even compared to its close, its other close relative Tyrannosaurus. So the, the skull was actually positioned in such a way that its eyes would have pointed directly forward. And it would have given it binocular vision, which is something that we see in a lot of modern predators. And that gives them uh, the ability to determine how close something is much better than other things. But we can also look at other parts. In fact, we can look at parts of their brain 
Um, and we can actually see how good they were, or we can we suspect that they were really good at at something called motion tracking, which is your ability to lock onto a moving target or lock onto a target. And yeah, as you move your head to to see exactly where it is. And so based on this, our current or our current understanding of vision in tyrannosaurs actually suggests that they could see several kilometers and probably had very, very good vision. And some people actually liken them to having hawk like vision. Oh. So standing still in front of a tyrannosaurus probably wouldn't have been your best your best course of action. So you just, you ever face you face just take my plan. If I ever meet a Tyrannosaurus, I was just going to stand there. You're just taking that completely away from me. Uh, so they don't, what you're saying is they don't have <laughs> a weakness that you can kind of get away from them. Not in terms of like their, their vision. It seems like they they were uh, probably faster than us, at least even if they were, even as adults, they were probably faster than us. They probably could smell us. They could probably see us. Just, just probably when, yeah, you <laughs> ideally, you just want to hope that as if you were come face to face with an adult T-Rex, that you were in that size range that you were too small to be worth it for it. Yeah, just curl up in a ball and close your eyes and hope for the yeah. best. Um, awesome. So we've got um, one from Brooke on behalf of uh, Serena. Sorry if I ever pronounced your name wrong there. Uh, age 10. Uh, and they want to know how long a Tyrannosaurus uh, lived for. How, 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 what was their lifespan like? Yeah, so one of the really interesting things that we've actually learned about Tyrannosaurs and dino we do this with dinosaurs in general, so not just tyrannosaurs, but we can actually take their their bones, their limb bones, we can actually cut those. And much like you can count the rings in a tree to determine how old it is, you can kind of do the same exact thing with uh, a lot of dinosaur species where you can actually look in them and you can see bones from where there was a season. So during the, the dry season or the winter season, there wasn't as much food to go around. And so uh, it would have slowed down its growth. And then during the spring and the summers, it would just speed that up and then it would slow it down. So you can actually count those kind of like like growth rings. And our oldest tyrannosaurs uh, seem to be, our oldest tyrannosaur specimens seem to be around 30 or so years old or, or late twenties, early thirties uh, in terms of age. And so these are, uh, this seems to be about as old as they, as they get, but who knows, there might be older individuals out there. We just haven't found them yet. Well, oh, amazing. Um, we've got lots of questions still coming in. Thank you very much, guys. Um, we had one from Liam asking if you like the Jurassic Park movies. I think I know the answer to that one. I love the Jurassic Park movies. <laughs> How accurate are they? There are some inaccuracies. There are, uh, <laughs> and I mean, every paleontologist will tell you. I've always loved the Jurassic Park movies. They've kind of, I think they are kind of what got me into paleontology in the first place. And mm. so I, I think I owe them a lot in a way. Um, but there are some inaccuracies, of course. So like raptors, like Velociraptor would have been one smaller. Uh, they would have had feathers. Um, their wrists, one of the big things that we always see is that their wrists, whenever you see them, we always call them slappers versus clappers. Uh, so knee slappers versus just hand clappers. Dinosaurs actually couldn't turn their wrists to be slappers. So they couldn't actually slap their knees like that. Oh. Yeah, they, they, they are, the way that their wrists are set up, they would have actually been like this, kind of like how you see in bird, bird wings where they kind of fold them down. And we can't really fold our hands this way, but birds can actually fold them all the way against their, their forearm here. And that's kind of the same way that a lot of dinosaurs would have been. Is their, arm, their, hands would, their palms would have faced each other as they held them, and they wouldn't have been able to turn them to be able to touch their belly or anything like that. Crazy. Um... So we've got some questions. Uh, I think people now want to know about friendly dinosaurs. So um, we had one from Diana um, asking, what is the biggest but friendliest? So I'm guessing um, herbivore or plant eater. Biggest herbivore. Um, it's actually, so there are a bunch of these different kinds of animals, so like the long neck dinosaurs, which we call the sauropods. And there's been a kind of a lot of thought as to what would be the largest one in there. So oh, there's a whole bunch of contenders, things like sauroposide and um, Dreadnoughtus, these really bizarre names, but probably the largest that I think is currently or currently accepted as the largest friendly or largest herbivorous dinosaur is an animal from uh, Argentina called Argentinosaurus. Um, mm -hmm. And it was a very large, several, it was over 100 feet in length. Um, and so I think that's currently thought of as being the largest, the largest friendly dinosaur. Ah, uh, so I've got one here. It looks pretty friendly. Um, <laughs> Kind of like a tiger here, long neck. I'm guessing this one ate trees. Exactly. Yeah. So they were they were occupying a similar um, what we call niche or uh, environmental role. So what they did in their environment, probably to what we kind of see modern day giraffes, where they would they would probably be eating the tops of the tree, or the tops of the tree, or uh, the the juicier leaves that are higher up in a tree than kind of like lower giraffes. down. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Excellent. Um, so we've got so many questions here, um, kind of going back and forth from uh, meat to 
not meat plants. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got uh, MK here uh, wants to know, um, is was the Tyrannosaurus uh, a scavenger? So did it eat kind of dead carrion and stuff? So there's so this is a this is an idea that was brought up many many years ago, um, and kind of it's it's always been kind of like contentious about that that it was only a scavenger and the kind of the idea is that it wasn't just a scavenger, um, the the kind of the idea is that as they got older they supposedly got bigger and they got too slow to to be able to catch food and so they would actually start to only be scavenging food, but in modern ecosystems so in modern in the modern world there really isn't a purely terrestrial scavenger or purely land-based scavenger so like hmm. a lot of times people would say that tyrannosaurus looked like a hyena where it would just scavenge dead things but hyenas are actually very active predators and they would have they actually hunt their own prey all the time um, and so the kind of the idea is that tyrannosaurus rex might actually have been one of those animals that it was opportunistic so if it came across something that was already killed it wouldn't turn it down to just to go hunt something else so right. it would definitely eat a scavenge kill if it came across it but at the same time if it needed to it could very easily uh probably take down its own prey actively hunt wow so again they can do pretty much anything they <laughs> probably yeah ultimate dinosaur um gabriel uh would like to know which dinosaur had the most teeth that's a tricky one. Oh, that, that is a tricky one. one. There are there are actually a lot of contenders for this. Um, <laughs> one in particular that I'm thinking of right now, but I know that there are others, uh, is a really close relative of those ornithomimid dinosaurs again. It's actually a very early form of these called Pelicanimimus. And it had tons of tiny, tiny, tiny teeth. Well, can you say the name again? Pelican? Pelicanimimus. Pelican. So it's like Pelican, Pelicanimimus. Brilliant. Uh, so most teeth. Um, we had one earlier from Kiera. Uh, I wanted to know about poison spitters. Um, was that a thing or was that a Jurassic Park creation? That, that was a Jurassic Park creation. Uh, oh. From what we understand right now, there we don't have any evidence of any uh, venomous or poisonous type dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. um, there is, in modern ecosystems, there is one type of poison, poisonous bird, and I can't remember the species, what it's called, but it's, uh, it's a very interesting bird. It what it eats, it actually... Uh, the i think it, whatever it eats it actually secretes that poison through its wow. uh into its feathers and so it actually has become poisonous itself so if something were to eat it it would actually uh, the thing that ate it would actually be poisonous oh that is incredible that and is so a, yeah didn't know that one um <laughs> so we've got lots more coming in uh, jenny would like to know um how do we know what dinosaurs sound like i think jurassic park either movie would be uh, pretty boring without those big <laughs> I'm guessing they didn't have a microphone to a dinosaur. So um, how do they make those as well? So was it guesswork? Uh, I think that a lot of the Jurassic Park animals and the sounds that they actually make, they were actually taking off of modern animals and modern, and even like sometimes they were maybe even taking them from uh, maybe not just modern animals, but maybe just noises that we're making in like with just banging objects together, that it's sort of thing. Breaking celery for like yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had heard, and I don't, I, I read a thing a couple years back about what they did use for this. And I want to say that they used elephants for like the T-Rex's calls. And then there are other things, they kind of modified the sounds from other animals as well to make some of the other dinosaur calls. Um, but in terms of what we actually know about dinosaur noises, we actually don't all know all that much. Um, we know that birds obviously are very vocal animals and that's one of their primary means of communication, that and their very vibrant plumage or their very vibrant colors. Um, so it's possible that a lot of dinosaur species actually had had some very complex noises as well. In fact, one of the things that one of the animals that we think of specifically are the some of the duck-billed dinosaurs that we actually know of. So things like Parasaurolophus, um, they have a very complex network of tubes that actually run through those very large horn crests that they have. Uh, and the kind of the idea is that they actually may have blown air through those tubes to actually create like a resonant chamber. And so it would have actually made these really these really loud honking noises, kind of like a trumpet. Yeah. Wow, that is that is really cool. Musical dinosaurs. Um, we've got uh, another one here. Uh, oh, I'll just put it down here. Um, oh, Whitney had a really cool question that I'm um, personally quite uh, curious about. Uh, it's about sharks. Um, so um, I know that Megalodon, huge, huge kind of shark, prehistoric ish um they have cartilage for bones uh how do they fossilize and, and do they fossilize yes yeah, so those kinds of so having cartilage for bones is actually 
really advantageous to sharks in modern ecosystems. It helps them, one, it helps them remain neutrally buoyant, meaning that they don't float or they don't sink, uh, but it's also really flexible. Cartilages are very flexible. We actually have cartilage in our own bodies, in our ears, and actually forming the, the points in between our bones. Um, but as for fossilization, a lot of times with sharks, what we find is actually is their teeth. So their teeth are made of enamel and enamel is uh, very easy to fossilize or much easier to fossilize than cartilage. But occasionally, occasionally we do find fossilized cartilage. If you have a perfect environment uh, where you have rapid burial, so the animal that once it dies, it becomes buried very quickly, uh, doesn't have much bacteria that can get into it and cause it to decay. Um, you can get fossilized cartilage. And there are some instances of uh, fossilized shark skeletons and the, the skeletons. In fact, there are some that we've actually found here in Alberta from some uh, from like rays. So like um, skates and rays, we have some fossilized, mm. some ancient fossilized skates and rays, uh, but it's rare, but it does happen that we get fossilized cartilage occasionally. Oh, amazing. Um, we've got a question here from Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer would like to know uh, if you've ever found a protoceratops. I have not found a protoceratops, unfortunately. Those are uh, an animal that is currently only found in Mongolia. Uh, as far as we know, they're only found in Mongolia or in that in that kind of area. You and I had. I'm sorry. You know when your next holiday is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've really wanted to get to Mongolia to, to go see what it's like out there. It's a beautiful place from all the pictures that I've seen. Yeah. Um, but I have found bones from protoceratops' close relatives, things like triceratops. I've found uh, little kinds of bones of uh, another type of uh, ceratops that's actually got a really, one of my favorite names for a, for a dinosaur. It's called xenoceratops. And it's like spelled X-E-N-O ceratops. And it means strange horn faced. <laughs> what a name yeah it call itself that <laughs> yeah um we've got uh, i'm gonna kind of do a quick round here lots of quick okay. questions um what is the best swimming dinosaur there are a bunch of contenders there's uh, some raptor type of dinosaurs called house raptor that have been proposed and then there's also recently there was something called spinosaurus uh that was thought that is being more and more data showing that this might have actually been a very pro a very strong swimmer uh swimming type dinosaur Awesome. Uh, I've got um, Serena would like to know, uh, she's 10 and she would like to know what the tallest dinosaur was. I think that actually goes back to the, to the Argentinosaurus or, or maybe, maybe not Argentinosaurus, but some of the, some of its close relatives like Brachiosaurus as well. Excellent. Um, uh, Alfie would like to know how many Tyrannosaur species are there? Oh, wow. Ooh. That's a tricky one. 15, I think, oh, there you 15 go. or so. I, I, I want to say that's close, if not right, or not exact right yeah. now. I'm not 100% sure on that, but there are there are about 15 or awesome. somewhere in that range. Um, Atticus, who's 10, I would like to know what the funniest or the most crazy dinosaur name is that you know. Funniest or the craziest dinosaur like the name? face one, that was pretty funny. Yeah, the Xenoceratops is, is a very interesting name, and I think that's that, that would be my contender for being... One of the most interesting, though, actually, there is one other. Um, there is a dinosaur that was found in Africa um, many, many years ago. And it actually, it can, I, th I forget the length, the dialect that it's in, but it has a click in its name. And I believe it's pronounced Makwebosaurus. And it's another type of those Ornithomimosaurus. So that is one of the most interesting names that I think is out there. And I really, I always, I like that. I like hearing that one. Yeah, that's great. So I've got a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. When you're looking at fossils and, um, and digging them up and things you obviously don't find them in order uh, they might be broken they might be scattered around uh, so how do you kind of piece that together is there a way that you can like a jigsaw puzzle imagine where things are going to go or how do you go about that I think yeah so the, so the way that it kind of works is like with um with we can find we know exactly what the some of like the the skull bones and whatnot are uh look like and so we can actually if we if you look at some of its close relatives we have the same basic outline as some of the dinosaurs that we actually uh that we actually see so like a lot of our animals have we still have a same the same kind of upper jawbone we have the same kind of lower jaw bones those sorts of things and so if we look at those and we see where those bones um, come from we can actually start to piece together exactly what it is and we can also use in cases where we actually get very well preserved and what we call articulated so the bones are actually put together we can use those as kind of a frame for any other discoveries uh, that we might make of other dinosaurs in the future that are not quite so complete that is amazing so i've got some um 
I've got some pictures of here out of you uh, mm -hmm. kind of out in the field. Um, so if you want to tell people kind of what you're doing and um, here we go, is a good one. Uh, uh, yeah, what are you doing here? Yeah, so this is where we had uh, we had a dinosaur and uh, we were interested in, we, we'd already flipped it so that you can see that at the bottom of that big rock where I'm chiseling away from, you see kind of a white layer at the bottom there. That is what we, where we had already plastered. And so what we were trying to do is we were trying to make this, this block smaller. And so I was taking a chisel and rock hammer to just break down the rock because we know that, that the fossil is not here in the part that I'm, that I'm chiseling away there. And so the goal was to just uh, make the rest of it smaller so that we can actually move it a lot easier. Excellent. So um, I'm going to go back to some viewer questions at the moment because they are just pouring in. So uh, mm -hmm. it's great to have you guys um, <laughs> being so active here. Um, Jake, who is three, would like to know what is your favorite dinosaur book? Mm. Probably my favorite dinosaur book. Um, in recent recent books, I would actually have to probably say it's uh, the book by Steve Brissotti, Dr. Steve Brissotti, which is The Rise and Fall of Dinosaurs, which I think is like an excellently well-written, and it's very well good at communicating the, the story of dinosaurs, if you will. But I remember the book as a kid, there was an encyclopedia that I had, and I can't remember the name of it, I'm sorry, but it was a little encyclopedia that I had that I remember reading front to cover all the time, just talked about all the different dinosaur species. And since then, it's been really outdated, but... Yeah. I, I still have that book uh, back home in North Carolina. So oh. it's kind of a soft spot in my heart. Oh, excellent. So I'm just looking at the clock and uh, it looks like we've got around five more minutes here. Uh, so if you've got any kind of pushing questions that have been on your mind, viewers, uh, do this is your kind of last chance to get them through here. Um, I've got one from MK and uh, they say, did Spinosaurus ever hunt on land? So we don't actually know. So this is a this is a question that's still being that's still kind of curious. We we don't really know. The more day that we've been finding more out about it, it seems to be very. Uh, it seems to be more and more that it's more aquatic in its nature, or at least that it was at least partially aquatic. But it could. There's always a possibility that maybe it was somewhat something like an ambush hunter, like modern crocs, where if there were a smaller animal. Uh, that were on the shoreline drinking water, maybe it could lunge out and grab it. Probably not be able to do that with some of the bigger animals, but it's possible. Right. That some of the smaller ones could do that. Great. Thank you. Uh, that was a great question. Um, we've got one from uh, Bennett here who wants to know a little bit more about megalodons. Uh, and if you ever found one. I actually have. Uh, so oh, hey. megalodons are hey. actually, hey. megalodons are found in North Carolina. Um, if you go down to the beach, you can actually find some of what they're called the phosphate mines. Uh, and they would dump their, they would dump while they were mining for phosphate, which is a good, a good material for fertilizers. They were actually dump some of the, the old, the fossil spoil piles into these little um, areas where people could go by and actually uh, dig up some of the fossils. And so uh, we went as a class during when I was in college, we went as a class to go uh, learn about the, the ocean environments and like what paleontology was like in the ocean environments. And we stopped at one of these sites and I was digging around and I found a little fragment of a smaller, smaller Megalodon, wow, which is a pretty interesting discovery. That is amazing. Cause I've seen some of those teeth and they're like dinner plates like this. They're huge. Mine was not quite that big. It was only about that big, but still oh, that's uh, crazy. That's amazing. Fairly large animal. Um, we've got one um, from Alyssa. Uh, Robinson wants to know about uh, a bite force. I know you did uh, kind of answer that one earlier on. Uh, so if you kind of want to quickly sum that one up uh, in a few things, if you can. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, so we can determine bite force in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, and one of the ways is by looking at their musculature, like how how strong were their muscles in their, in their jaw. And uh, there are different, we have different estimates for different dinosaurs. Tyrannosaurus rex seems to have one of the highest bite forces. And then a lot of its close relatives, other Tyrannosaurus also seem to have some pretty strong bite forces. Whereas some of the other slicing type meat eaters seem to have some of the lower bite forces. Lovely, thank you. Um, Gabriel wants to know why dinosaurs were so much bigger than us and how they got so big. This is a question that's always been kind of interesting. So one of the one of the ideas is that because they were, uh, it's it's kind of complicated. But getting into one, they maybe started off smaller, but then they started some of them started to get bigger, and so maybe it was an arms race between predators and prey to get bigger, so that you weren't hunted, or bigger, so that you could hunt those bigger things. And then there's also some ideas about how they were so their lung system, their respiratory system, might have played a big role in this, and that one being able to 
dinosaurs had a very intricate lung system throughout their whole skeleton or throughout their whole skeleton that allowed them to uh, breathe out maybe more or expel more heat from their body than mammals could do. Mm. Um, and so that might have been a, a big help in being able allowing in these animals to actually get to the sizes that we are not we've never been able to see in uh, at least in um, terrestrial or land based mammals. Great. That is uh, awesome. I saw um, a picture of a dragonfly uh, from prehistoric times. It was like six foot long or mm -hmm. like a wingspan. Absolutely amazing. Um, just looking, it looks like we're just about out of time. I'm sorry, viewers, the question is still pouring through here. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I want to thank you, Jared. You've been uh, absolutely amazing answering all uh, dinosaur questions from all different eras and everything. Uh, so thank you very much. And um, viewers, if you'd like to see what's coming up on our next programs, events, uh, do uh, register for our newsletter or visit sparkscience.ca. Uh, this has been great fun. Thank you again. And um, we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks for having me. Thanks very much. Bye, everyone.